You're listening to the West Side Podcast, a part of the LA International Church of Christ family of churches, worshiping God in LA since 1989. Well, welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you on this uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, what an awesome time to be together. So many new friends, faces out here. I know a lot of you found us online or you found us just through driving down the street. So welcome. It is a good day. It's a tremendous day, and we're grateful to have you here with us this morning. Wasn't Charles' story kind of amazing, inspiring? I want to tell you a story as well. It's a story about uh, God doing the impossible in a small thing. Not a grand community change or the the power of forgiveness that that Charles had that that gave him really a new life. It's something super simple. Maybe you can relate. You ever lost your car keys? Well, a number of years ago, I was driving, uh, Carrie and I had a Honda minivan. We needed that. Our kids were, at the time, Kyle and Caitlin were five and eight years old. It was before Nathan was even born. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you know it, but those keys, those the minivan keys, are pretty valuable. You know, they can open the sliding doors, and I was super grateful for it. But I had lost it, and I checked into how much it would cost to replace it. You ever, you ever check that out? It's like... It's high, right? 300, 400. It's a lot of money. I was like, okay, I don't want to drop that much money on a stupid lost key. So I was like, I got to find this. So I waited a whole week, couldn't find it. And finally, I was like, all right, we got to come up with something. Something's got to be done. And what we ended up doing was I said, all right, I'm a man of faith. I got to get my family praying. I got to get my family faithful. So my five-year-old daughter, Caitlin, at that time, she's five. um, I said, all right, we got to pray. So we get on our knees. So we prayed. God, you got to work. you got to work in a powerful way. All right, we all right with that? Okay. And uh, so we got on our knees and I said, I pray. The Bible does say the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. But then I had a five-year-old girl and I thought, surely she's without sin, so you got to pray. <laughs> and so she's like, God, tell my dad find his key. In Jesus' name, amen. And we stood up. And then I got a phone call right then. And I picked up the phone. It was my friend Lisa Burroughs. And she goes, hey, Steve, um, I don't even know why I called you. Sorry, I must have misdialed for some reason. And I go, no problem, Lisa. Have a great day. And I hung up the phone, and I immediately knew where, where my key was. Her and her husband had visited Carrie and I a week earlier, or two weeks earlier. I don't know how long ago it was before I lost that key. But when they were visiting, I had to give her husband, Kevin, something out of the trunk of my other car. And it all came back to me that when I was in the trunk of the car, I probably had the key. I probably left it in the trunk of the car. I'd already checked the trunk of the car, but all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe it slid down under the wheel well in the trunk. And that's exactly where it was. God was like, all right, you're going to be faithful in a prayer. I'm going to answer your prayer. The impossible is possible. Amen? I know this is a simple thing, and today we're reflecting on something far greater than just finding your lost key, but I hope that today you find maybe something you have lost. Maybe a a faith that you had at one time. Maybe a zeal for that faith that you had at one time. Maybe just a sense of peace that you had as a child. Maybe a hope that you held on to. But God can give you an impossible life of forgiveness and hope and vision and peace and purpose. And that's his plan. Amen? And that's what the resurrection is all about. I looked up a website on all the different um, famous quotes about doing the impossible. I found this one from Alexander the Great. There is nothing impossible to him who will try. Of course, great conqueror. I found Nelson Mandela. It, it always seems impossible until it's done. Then Michael Phelps says, dream as big as you can dream. Anything is possible. And then I found this one on that website. It says, with God, all things are possible. But it said anonymous. <laughs> anonymous? Here's who said that. Right? <laughs> with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Jesus. God wants to do the impossible in our lives. God makes the impossible life possible. 
That is what the resurrection is about. The resurrection is not just a religious tradition. And for many of us, church becomes traditional. I didn't grow up going to church, really. I grew up uh, with a sort of an agnostic slash atheistic faith, not really sure what I believed. But I've been coming to church now for many years, having become a, a faithful disciple in my college days. But even now, it's important to not look at the resurrection as just a religious tradition. It means that all things are different. It's a historical event. It's a powerful thing. And you need faith to have this impossible life. And so today, we're going through a series called By Faith. And today, the the scripture, the theme scripture for the the Easter Sunday is Hebrews 11.6, about faith. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But by faith, God makes the impossible life possible. And so we're going to dig into this a little bit today. But, you know, this idea of faith in chapter 11, verse 1, we covered this, Ben hit this. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I believe you all have hopes in life. Many hopes. God intends for those hopes to be brought to fruition when they originate from his spirit, when they're hopes that he has planted in all of humanity and in in you individually. Faith is confidence in this. And we're going to talk today about faith making life incredible. If you live by faith, you're going to have an impossible life. To live the impossible life, three things are going to hit. Faith he exists, faith he rewards, and faith to seek him. Amen? And I hope today you will latch on to one of these little aspects of faith and really allow your faith to grow. Faith exists. Okay, so without faith, it's impossible to please God, it says very simply. And I think most of us believe He exists. There are many things that attest His existence, right? The sunrise. I don't know if you went out on the beach lately, but it's been beautiful, hasn't it? Right? I I was out there on Friday morning, and you just saw the, the, the sky light up, and I was there before sunrise. It was awesome. You kind of know there's a creator when you see the grandeur of his nature, right? When you, when you see the paintings that he paints all over the world, you know, he's a God of beauty. New life attests to God's reality, doesn't he? Any of you um, parents in here? When the child is born, it's amazing, Right? I mean, you're just blown away. How, how could they look partly like both mom and dad? Or just seeing the miracle of new life. You know, a little good news for the West Side. Uh, Carrie and I, in October, will become uh, grandparents. Our son, uh, our son Kyle and his wife, Jasmine, are pregnant. We just found that out. So, wow, a new life. God is real. I, you, you, you know he exists from things like that. But you know, the resurrection is the one thing... I was a history major at UCLA. I know we have some UCLA students here. And history can give you a springboard to a value system and a way of thinking that can change everything. Especially the history of the resurrection of the Son of God. And so if you look at the history and the evidence that's out there, it's tough to explain away. Right? It's tough to explain away. There clearly was an empty tomb. And there clearly was sightings of Jesus by over 500 witnesses, the book of 1 Corinthians says. It's a true thing. His resurrection was real. And he wasn't just a spirit that resurrected. His physical body resurrected. And it resurrected in some kind of new physical way. Now, this is the amazing thing. A lot of us might think, hey, uh, knowing God is about believing in Him. And then when you believe in Him, when you die, you, you float up off into heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. Jesus resurrected in a physical body. But it was a new kind of physicality. It was spiritual and physical merged together in some miraculous way. He could appear through walls. We'll read a scripture about that a little later. Right? He could eat. But he could also just evaporate straight into the heavenly realm. 
which is a which is really right in this room. The heavenly realm is right here. There's simply a veil between what we see and experience and the heavenly re- reality. And someday, God will recreate all things. And He'll resurrect each of us that have faith in Jesus to a physical, a new kind of physicality where He combines the spiritual and physical. He's not discarding His creation. His creation is good. Amen? N.T. Wright wrote about this. Great New Testament scholar. He wrote an 800-page book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. And he went through every bit of history you could ever imagine to prove and talk about what was going on. And here we are, 2023, talking about the resurrection of Jesus in the west side of Los Angeles. Why? Because it happened. Right? He said in order to explain, historically, all the early Christians came to, to the belief that they held that Jesus had been raised. We have to say at least this, that the tomb was empty except for some grave clothes, and that they really did see and talk with someone who gave every appearance of being a solidly physical Jesus. Though a Jesus who was strangely changed, more strangely than they were able fully to describe. The history books, the evidence that exists, make this irrefutable. I do want to show you a funny video to make the point. I need 100% participation for this award. Yeah, everyone's here. All 12. 11. 11 of us. Well, what's the plan? Well, as you know, Jesus is dead. But stay with me, stay with me, okay? Stay with me. I have a plan. We are going to steal his body. Okay, okay, I'm tracking with you. What's next? And then, we're going to tell the whole world that he rose from the dead. Oh, you know what I mean? I love her. <laughs> all right, classic, classic. Then what? And then, we're all going to be brutally murdered. <laughs> Could you go over that last part real, real quick? Oh, uh, what? We get murdered. What's the problem? Uh, I like it. <laughs> I like it. You know, don't get me wrong, Pete. I love me a good hoax as much as the next guy. Right? And, uh, oh, what's in it for us? Do we all get riches, fame, and fortune first? Right? No, no, get this. You're going to be hated, persecuted, and reviled for the rest of your life! Missing something here, right? Okay? I mean, why on earth would we do this? Get, can we start over? Oh, okay, we'll start from the beginning. Everybody, for John, yeah. the brother disabled. So, okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so it makes the point. Why would you die for a lie? The evidence is real. The world has been changed. No one has affected life on this earth as much as Jesus Christ. And His resurrection is historically true. The question for you is, do you have faith that He exists? And if He resurrected, you know Jesus can hear you, see you. Somehow He can cross that veil. That veil from the spiritual to the physical. He could show up and sit in the chair. He did that day. He could. I've not ever seen Him physically. But He says someday He's coming back. Do you believe He exists? I think, unfortunately, sometimes we say, oh, I believe. But by our actions, we don't really believe it. I'll share an example of my own, you know, failures as a husband sometimes. You know, sometimes it hasn't happened that much lately because I think I'm getting better. Amen. But over the years, Carrie and I might go to a social engagement, maybe a, a dinner with some friends or Certainly, I would go to a wedding, if I'm not performing the wedding, going and just celebrating with uh, somebody getting married. And I'm a very social guy, and I like to talk to everybody. But oftentimes, these are Saturday night, which would be like a date night, and I'll go out to dinner. So, most important person in my life next to Jesus is Carrie, right? My wife. 
Uh, she's number one. Top priority. Kids know that. She's number one. And yet oftentimes I'll arrive at one of these events. Again, this is like, I don't think so much lately. She can, you know, she can attest to that. But I would just talk to everybody else the whole time. I would sit next to her and barely pay attention to her at all, right? You could even say I act like she doesn't exist in the way I'm just spending my time with things I want to do, meeting new people or people I've seen or somebody new I know. Oftentimes, she feels that, or used to. (laughs) Husbands. All of us. Let's take a good look at where we at. Do you have faith God exists? Or might, in fact, it be that you say he does, but act like he doesn't? Is he present in your life? Does he affect the way you think? Does he affect your moral choices? Does he affect how you spend your time? Do you have faith that he exists? Because most certainly, he does exist. Amen? And I hope today, on Easter morning, as we reflect on the resurrection, I want you to be challenged a little bit to think about, am I living a life that reflects the resurrection? Am I living a life that says he does exist? And I believe it, and you can tell by the way I live. Amen? Point two. Let's go to the next next one, guys. Faith, he rewards. See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes in must believe that he exists and that he rewards. Right? He rewards. That serving God is not um, an empty endeavor. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because anything good that you do, He's not going to forget. I tell artists this often. Hey, if you create something beautiful in the glory of God, if you do anything to the glory of God, it's not forgotten. It's going to be brought forward into this new creation. He does reward us all kinds of ways. I don't have time to go through all His promises. That's a whole different sermon. But He does reward us in some amazing ways. One of my favorite verses... I do read this oftentimes in weddings. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. What is God going to reward you with? The desires of your heart. But what kind of desires? If you really find your joy in Him, in knowing Him, praying to Him, serving Him, learning about Him, walking with Him, like Enoch did, we talked about that last week, and God actually took him off the earth. When you truly delight yourself in Him, He gives you the desires of your heart. But those desires become originated and molded by His heart itself. Your desires end up pleasing Him. And why would God not give things that He wants for you to you when you desire them? But if your desires are self-oriented, hurtful, If your ultimate desire is power and money for the sake of vanity and domination, God may not be too pleased with that. He gives grace to the humble and opposes the proud. He's not going to give you every desire of your heart if it originates in a self-gratifying, self-glorifying way. Do you want a partner in life? I think a lot of us do, right? A lot of us want to get married. A lot of us are married in here. Right? It's a great victory. Uh, last week was a fantastic joy. Uh, got to do the wedding of Oscar and Jess. They're on their honeymoon right now. You know, the scripture does say a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife. And that is a deep desire that a lot of us have. God made us to want, the scriptures teach, unfailing love. And he's brought that quite often in here, so it's an incredible blessing. I know there's probably even more than I have written down, but I was thinking about the the weddings just in the past couple years. Um, Certainly Oscar and Jess just recently, uh, Chanel and Abraham, Seth and Marley, Chuka and Robin got married, Robin and Elizabeth, uh, Robin and Elizabeth, Nick and Gus got married, right? Garrett and Carolyn, Aaron and Melissa, Justin and Emma, 
Uh, we've got coming up, we've got EJ and Rocio, Erica and Joe, Billy and Jet, Billy uh, Wynn, his wife's out, or his uh, fiance is out in the Philippines trying to get her visa approved, and Jay Holbert as well, his wife's out in the, uh, or his fiance is out in Indonesia. I mean, God's doing these miracles in young people's lives to grant the desires of their heart. That's just one small reward I believe he gives. The biggest one, ultimately, is this. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see, I have. Right? He appeared to the guys. They weren't sure what to make of it. He showed up right in the middle of the room. It just says, they were talking, all of a sudden he just stood in there right among them. And he said, peace be with you. Peace. In John, he says, my peace I give to you. This morning, do you have peace? Because that's what God wants us to experience. He also says in John, in this world... You will have trouble. But he says, you will have peace in the middle of trouble when you are with me. Amen? That's God's ultimate promise. I think that as we go about our lives on earth today, achieving, accomplishing relationships, serving all the things we do, he wants us to have a peace that passes understanding, that comes from realizing what really matters, and relationships matter. Love matters. People matter. God matters. Eternity matters. And every one of us can be controlled by a fear of death. We don't really know what's going to happen because all of us in here, we haven't died yet. But Jesus did die and resurrect. And he puts us at peace because he says, I am preparing a place for you, but he's calling you to live a life of faith. Peace in this world can be attainable in your heart, although I don't think it's going to happen in the geopolitical situations going on out there until Jesus returns. But you can have the peace that Jesus wants to reward us with. Amen? Three people who added that peace just this past two, three weeks. we got Jonathan in the campus. Right there in the middle is, uh, is uh, Charles Peralta got baptized on, on Friday or Thursday. It was awesome. And Aaron got baptized on Friday. Uh, it was awesome to be at the Good Friday event. It was great being there. Peace. A peace that passes understanding. God has that in store for all of us. Last point as we close out before we take communion. A faith to seek Him. See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes in must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, the actual Greek just has the word, uh, uh, let me pronounce it correctly for you here. The correct word is uh, exoteo. And it's just one word, but the English translation, the NIV, uses earnestly seek. Because in the Greek, that's what it involves. A depth of seeking, not just kind of seeking, but diligently, fervently going after something. And God wants us to have the faith to seek Him out in a powerful way. This morning, I hope that your heart is moved by the resurrection. Recognizing that life is more than what America says it is. What Europe says it is. What any continent on earth, any geopolitical situation going on, none of that is as important as the eternal truth of Jesus' resurrection and what it calls you to now. Because it proves that God has established a kingdom right now. Jesus is alive. And in time, all things will be made right. All justice will prevail. All goodness will prevail. And what God's asking us to do is seek Him and then join Him in this mission to install His kingdom At least a little foretaste of it. Just a little taste of it on earth. And that's what the church is supposed to be. A little taste of what eternity will be. In time, He'll return. And it'll all be made right. It'll all be made perfect. But we get to taste a little bit of it right now. Amen? How are we going to do it? 
Seeking God equals pleasing God. There's a lot of verses. You can do a search. How do you please God? I'm not going to go into all those this morning. But here's one simple one. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now, what he's talking about is the carnal, sinful flesh. He's not talking about our bodies are sinful in and of themselves. He's talking about the choices that go with that. When they're simply animalistic choices. He says, if you live that way, if you don't allow the Spirit, if you don't allow the Spirit to control the flesh... You won't please God, but by the Spirit of God, you can live a life of faith and transformation of other people and your own life. Jesus resurrected for all of us. I hope you believe that. I hope you understand that it's practical, it's tangible. It means something in your life right now. And I want you guys to consider an action step today on Sunday, Easter morning. What does it mean for you to earnestly seek God? To have a faith to really seek Him? Here's some simple steps. Number one, maybe the simple step for you to say, Yeah, Steve, I believe Jesus is real. The resurrection is real. I want to be, you know, filled with this peace and this hope. And I I believe it in my whole life, but maybe I haven't gone the full distance. This morning, maybe for you, it's simply meet with somebody to learn the Bible. A friend, a family member, somebody. You know, we train our small group leaders in the Westside Church to teach foundational Bible studies about faith and how to be a disciple, how to live for Jesus. Most of the people in the congregation understand some basic stuff about how to live like a disciple of Jesus. Ask somebody to study the Bible with you. Maybe just one time, one hour per week. Can you make that step? Maybe for you, that's seeking God right now. For some of you, maybe you've been coming out for a while, or maybe today's your first day, but I want to present to you this idea. Next week, CJ, our other evangelist, and myself are going to host a class called the Next Steps Class After Church. And the idea there is to train people on how do you take a step towards a faithful life as a disciple of Jesus. What does that look like? What does that look like for me individually? And that'll be next Sunday after church for one hour. I want to invite all of you, if you've come today, first time, if you've been coming for a while, please join CJ and I as we teach this class on next steps in our faith journey with God. Amen? Now, for some of you, maybe you've been coming here for a long time. Maybe you've been disciples and part of the church for 30 years. I'm going to challenge you on Resurrection Sunday, to think about a new way of serving. Commit to serving God in a new way. The resurrection is always newness. That doesn't mean you can stop doing all the serving you're doing. Sound guys, we still need you, all right? All the setup and tearing down crew. But maybe there's a new attitude you have about it. Maybe there's a, a, something excellent you'll bring to it. Maybe there is a new role you want to fill that you'll trade with somebody else. But I want to challenge all of us to have a faith to step out And to serve God in some new way. Because life in Christ is about new creation. It's about new transitions. It's about transformation. And it's hope-filled. And it's peace-filled. And I want to challenge you this morning to think about how you can earnestly seek God. Amen? Amen? The resurrection is glorious. It came because of the cross. And at this time, we're going to take a few moments to really reflect on the cross. And we're going to pray and ask God... To really just transform us this morning. Remember, when we take the bread, Jesus said, take this. It was on the night he was betrayed. He said, do this. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he gave him the cup, the fruit of the vine. He said, take this. Drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the new covenant. The opportunity for forgiveness. Not just one time, but of all time. Every day. Amen? Let's go to God in prayer as we take communion. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this morning to celebrate this victory of resurrection. And Father, we know that the resurrection followed the crucifixion. And we know, Jesus, that you gave your very life. Your body was beaten and bloodied for us. It inspires, it challenges, it humbles us to consider that. Thank you. Thank you so desperately for what you've done and what you plan to do in all our lives. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus shed to give us a new start, not just one time, but every day. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You've just listened to the West Side Podcast. For more information about our ministry, please visit thewestsidechurch.com or laicc.net.